Welcome back to Creator Talks and welcome new listeners. I'm your host, Christopher Calloway. This week, I have two episodes coming your way. The first, B.J. Mendelson is my guest. He is a writer. He has a comic book out on Comixology at the moment, Vengeance Nevada, All Will Be Judged. We're going to talk about his comic book, how it's been in the process of development over a couple of years. And he's made some tweaks to the original story and has fine-tuned that based on reader feedback and is now releasing the series through Comixology, and it will be four issues per year. So the first issue is now available on Comixology for you to check out. BJ is also an author of two books, at least. One called Social Media is Bull. Now, that's not the full name, but I'm not going to say the full name, and I think you know what it is. So it's available on Amazon. You can look it up there, and BJ will tell you after listening to this episode how you can get a copy yourself for free. And I'll tell you what, it's a great read. I have a copy. I read it. A lot of good information in there. Also, the end of privacy. In this age, this is very timely, how you can go about protecting yourself and your privacy on the internet so that your information is not shared without your consent and knowledge, and how that that is shared, you have control over. So, after we talk about Vengeance Nevada, we'll also talk about those two books, but I start by talking with BJ about his experiences as a mall Santa Claus. All that and more, here now on Creator Talks. Welcome to Creator Talks. Thank you so much for having me. There's a lot of content that you have written, and you have some strong opinions about marketing, and I want to discuss <laughs> those later on. Sure. <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. I think my listeners would love to hear about that as well. But first, I'm going to begin with a bit about you, and then move on to your comic, Vengeance Nevada. And after we discuss your comic and your other books, we'll take a deeper dive into things about you. That'll be fun. Now, a bit about you first. Are you still working on your doctorate? No, uh, you're the first person to, to ask me about that. You talk about the doctorate in American history? Yes. Yeah, no, I decided that I could just write a book, make some money, and, and have more fun uh, if I did it on my own or through a traditional publisher than if I did it using, I, I don't know if this is too technical, like if I had to write an APA style in order for it to be compliant to get a PhD, it wouldn't be as funny or interesting, I feel. Okay. Uh, just from my own experience, like I, I, you know, I took grad classes in a whole bunch of different places, and I didn't like that format. So no, I'm not working on the PhD, but at some point, I probably will go back to finish it. Well, in the meantime, you'll probably be able to save a lot of money on education. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> is it true that you were a mall Santa? Yes. Um, <laughs> there is photographic evidence for people that go to the Glens Falls Post Star. Uh, it's the newspaper upstate New York. In Glens Falls, and they search my name, Brandon Mendelson, and they'll see a picture of me with a little girl at the Aviation Mall in Queensbury, New York, where I'm dressed in full Santa suit. How long did you do that? Just one year? Yeah, it's, I did it for the holiday season one year. Uh, it was during the recession. So you know, at that point, you, you could take whatever you can get in terms of jobs. So that's all I did. What was the oddest thing a child ever asked you for when you were playing Santa? I don't know if it was the oddest thing so much as the strangest thing that happened was people at home have to picture that I'm a six foot four, very obviously Jewish individual, and I'm also very skinny. So one of the Santas looked like an actual Santa Claus, and I was kind of like the person he swapped out with when he was tired or, you know, his shift finished. So he got up and his little girl was watching him and he goes all the way back to the quote unquote dressing room, which was really like the garbage disposal area. Uh, for the mall food court. And he's like, all right, you're next. So I go out there and this little girl sees me coming up to the Santa entrance and she stomps her foot and she does like the, this L-shaped thing, like the loser thing, <laughs> <laughs> and put it, put the L on her forehead. And I just started cracking up. And that was my first day. Like that was uh, the first day on the job as a Santa. But nothing, I didn't get anything really odd. And, and one of the things they train you is there is no such thing as an odd request. The dodge is, oh, well, you know, I have to consult with your parents about that if it's, <laughs> if it's something really weird. Right. Uh, but no, I, I guess I was lucky in that right? nothing crazy really came up. Anything that was very emotional, very touching. Uh, so the Glenswells area is not the most 
economically prosperous in uh, upstate New York. And so there was a couple of kids, you know, very clearly, you know, they grew up like I did. Like I, I didn't come from a wealthy background at all. And, you know, you could tell that things were probably not great at home. Uh, and they were like in near tears because Santa was like this thing that they looked forward to. That was particularly challenging, but I, I kind of liked giving them that happy moment at the very least. And so uh, it, it was a little emotionally trying, but it did take some some brightness away from that. Yeah, it's great that they still have mall Santas and Santa appearances because when I was a kid, they had that all the time, you know. And I always thought it was weird that Santa would come in to this one location near me. It was a uh, kitty world. And back then, that was sort of like the Toys R Us, which is also going away. And uh, Santa would come by helicopter. And I'm like, well, where's the reindeer? I mean, I don't see the helicopter. And one time we had a local broadcaster who was on UHF back in the day. Oh, very cool. Wee Willie Weber was the uh, the host for Santa Claus. And I just remember watching Wee Willie Weber. and like, I didn't care about Santa Claus. I want to see the celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks for sharing that information with me. I was just curious to know a little bit about the Mall Santa experience sure. and what you experienced, but about your book now, Vengeance Nevada. It's a sci-fi thriller with heroes and horror. And, you know, nothing is really new under the sun. It's all how it's put together and expressed by the creator. And you've mixed several genres in this first issue, this one book. You're creating a whole new world. You put the chocolate and the peanut butter. You've mixed a black and tan. You put potato chips and the peanut butter and jelly. You know, congratulations. Nice mix going on there. Thank you. My first question, Mr. Boots. Who is the model for Mr. Boots? <laughs> uh, okay, so the thing with me is that everybody that's in the comic is based on someone that's real or someone that I've met. And so Mr. Boots is modeled after a cat that my ex-wife and I had named Bender. And uh, he had a very specific meow, which was meow, meow. And uh, so that's <laughs> what, what you see uh, Mr. Boots doing in the comic. And so that, that was the inspiration for the cat and his numerous adventures throughout the book. And everyone is modeled after an actual person. Interesting. Who do you have worked into the book? It's mostly friends. The reason why I did that was because uh, you know, look, I'm a white guy. Uh, and the cast is completely diverse. And it's mostly female. So in order to pull that off in a way that I felt was authentic I, you know i'm fortunate that most of my friends are women so i just went to a lot of them and said hey can i ask you some questions and, and let's talk about this and how would you react to that <laughs> so that's really how i constructed those characters was just going to my friends and using them as a reference and th there's a few celebrity facial uh <laughs> let's say borrowing in there that are going on mostly with uh, pro wrestlers because I'm a, I'm a wrestling fan but it's mostly it's mostly friends let's talk about the book for a bit people that don't know about the characters in the book one of the main characters krista she is uh, working for the police department she seems to be possessed by something a being that has fused their soul with a sword that she now possesses and she's become in a sense a spirit of vengeance that's exactly right uh but how i pitch the comic to people is as i say to them what if you suddenly got everything you ever wanted? And if you did, would you be a force for good or a force for evil? And one of the things the book explores is Kristen, who is very clearly bored in the first issue, is given this big adventure, you know, this thing that, that she always wanted. And, and as we find out later on, uh, this thing that's always been dangled in front of her, but then yanked away at the last second. And what I want to do was make sure that we show all sides of that conversation of, if you were given unlimited power, you know, maybe you don't do good things. So maybe you go down the dark path. And as this, I really like this spirit of vengeance, ghostwriter comparison, you know, one of the things we'll see with Kristen is, is that struggle between doing what she's always wanted and the consequences of it. And other characters in the book, death makes an appearance. Yes. Uh, I was always fascinated by the Marvel universe where they had incarnations of different elements so eternity is an actual character an actual thing that you can talk to uh, death is an actual thing that that you could talk to but doesn't actually talk in marvel comics so i, I really like that aspect of things and i wanted to bring that into vengeance about it because i knew i was going to play with the supernatural quite a bit and that lent itself to saying okay uh maybe death is not just a thing but an actual character with a point of view that's driving the story. And other characters in the book are the Syntharians. Who are they? 
Oh, man. Uh, how do I describe that? Or how much you can tell us, and with not spoiling anything. Oh, no. Um, so, okay, I'm doing this kind of thing where I feel a lot of comics today hold the reader's hand. And they explain everything in excruciating detail. There's just a ton of exposition that sort of gets into, like, this minutia of the world. The Syntharians are, are just something from Kristen's past that we see throughout the book, but they're not something that's really carried throughout the series. Like, in fact, I don't spend much time explaining uh, their backstory. I know what it is, but I kind of like this idea of I'm, I'm dropping the reader in the middle of this world. They're going to follow Kristen as she goes and explores. And I, I wanted to leave a little room for their imagination to fill in the blanks and say, all right, these things are dead, but they're coming back to life because there's these cybernetic parts attached to them that, that's sort of reanimating them. Uh, what's the story behind that? Why are they there? I, I just like that element of letting the reader kind of figure out. And then it also gives me, it gives me some wiggle room because I could always go back later and play with that uh, once Kristen's story is finished. Yes, there's a lot there to unpack. So you could read this a couple of times. You certainly should read it a couple of times to get the most out of it. Uh, there's also a group of heroes, and it includes a gorilla. And we know gorillas sell. That's a good <laughs> good move. <laughs> That's it. Well, I'm a, so I'm a huge uh, Sherlock Holmes fan to the point where it, you know I, I have strong opinions about the BBC series. I have the collected works of Arthur Conan Doyle, and I've read I think every year for the past five years. And so the gorilla is actually Sherlock Holmes inside of a gorilla's body. And I knew if I was going to do a comic book, that's the most comic book thing that you can do is have a, <laughs> a giant gorilla that just also happens to be Sherlock Holmes. So I, I knew that he had to make an appearance somehow. <laughs> you have strong opinions about the series. What are some of you? I'm curious because I, I saw the series. Some of it I loved, especially in the beginning. And then towards yeah. the end, not so much. But a lot of people like the show. And I'm just curious, what are your thoughts being a, an avid fan of Mr. Holmes? I mean, I enjoy the show. I enjoy the cast. It definitely gets away from the source material, especially at the end of the third season, going into the possibly final fourth season with the sister. It's the same way I feel about comic books. If you're going to translate and adapt something, you're more likely to be successful if you follow the source material than you are to stray too far from it. I think that we've seen that time and again with a lot of superhero movies where, you know, if you look at the Halle Berry Catwoman, uh, there's nothing that's even remotely really the Catwoman in that film other than the title. They just took the name and did something completely different. And I kind of felt that way with the later seasons of Sherlock, where they were sort of adding and embellishing. And I, I never really got into the guy who played Moriarty. I felt that, again, this is a writer's thing, so it's not a direct criticism of the show because obviously you know, they had a vision and they, they had a specific voice they wanted to carry for the character. But I just didn't feel like that was the way that character should behave. And it, it always sort of irked me to the point where I was glad that he dies in the series. Uh, and, you know, he points where he comes back. It's, it's usually through a video or something else because I, I felt that it really took away from the actual show. I was so distracted by it that I had trouble getting through it. I know I'm a nerd, so I, I got to <laughs> I get hung up on stuff like that. I don't have a problem with movies and TV shows straying a bit, you know, taking their own, so to speak, take on it. But... The source material is there for a reason, and if you stray too far, it's something else. Right. You know, it's not the same character, so call it something else. You know, I know there's money to be made calling it what you do, but you know, you go too far, and then it's unrecognizable, and that's where I have a problem. You know, don't be a slave to continuity, but also don't stray too far. Otherwise, the essence of what makes a character who they are is missing. Exactly, and I feel you know you can see that with Jumanji with the, the remake. I know people enjoyed it. It was a big box office success, but it, it has, with the exception of you know a callback here or there, it's got very little to do with the Robin Williams film. And as a child in the '90s, I saw that and I was like, "All right, why are you, why are you remaking this and making it a completely different thing?" And uh, we also see that coming up with the Rampage film. Very clearly, I mean, the, there's not much to the game. Let's be clear: uh, you're just a giant lizard punching the crap out of things. Uh, in order to score points and move on to the next level. Like, that's the entirety of Rampage, the arcade game. But just the fact that they took it and slapped a name on uh, this entirely different IP uh, just sort of struck me as odd. When I go to see movies like that, and like Jumanji, I'm just looking at it as a movie in and of itself, not attached to anything else. It's a lot easier right. for me to, to watch it. I can't say, well, this is a callback too. 
it, you're just setting yourself up with disappointment. <laughs> it's true. I, I feel that way about the new Star Wars films. That's mm. that's exactly how I look at them. It, it's Star Wars in name only. I, that, that's not to say I don't enjoy it, but the Disney Star Wars films, I, I treat as something completely different from the ones released by Fox. Yeah, I have to also. I, I enjoyed them. Uh, not as much as I hoped the first one when they came back. I enjoyed that more than the second one. I just, <laughs> something was just, uh, I just, I just had some, I mean, I'm not super nerdy about it, but there were some things that just didn't sit well with me. Right. Uh, and, and, and just the way even it played out towards the end. And it almost like it was some kind of like, and this is the new beginning. I'm like, why are you doing this now? Shouldn't that come right. later? It just, I don't know. Just something seemed a little odd to me. The challenge for the sequel trilogy is that no matter what they do, they can't escape the weight of 20 plus years of expectations so there's people that are, are not going to be happy no matter. I mean, they could, they could do, um, I used to read the books. So even if they did the books where Han and Leia had twins, people would still find something to be upset about. <laughs> so to me, I try to take this a very objective, okay, they're just doing something different and that's fine. But yeah, I agree. There, there were some choices with The Last Jedi where I felt this would be fine if it was the final Star Wars film. But knowing that they have Solo coming out and they have Episode Nine and probably 10, 11, and 12, not too far in the distant future, uh, I, I felt, yeah, there were some things done in it, like the kid, where I was like, this probably is not the place to have this. Right. And if Mark Hamill had problems with it, well, come on. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> you got more people, right? <laughs> I'm sorry. We're digressing all over the place, but I want to get back to your book. Sure. Now, your book, you started out posting that on your website. I believe, and you did it in chapters and sections, almost like DC's Digital First, where they put out a few pages each week. Yeah, I, so coming from the marketing world, I hate using the term minimum viable product because it's just been <laughs> it's been beaten into the ground by all these <laughs> marketing hucksters. Uh, but there's something to be said about the general idea. And so for people that don't know, it's exactly what it sounds like. You know, you're putting out not like the shittiest version of your product, and, and that's a mistake a lot of people make, but you're putting out the bare essentials behind something you're passionate about to see how the audience will react. But So Vengeance of Mata has been years in the making. I mean, we started, I started on this in the fall of 2015, and I spent a good year or two with different concepts and putting out different sections on the website and saying, uh, what do you think about this? And then sharing it with my friends and gathering reactions and gathering feedback. I feel like that's the really the best way to approach, especially when you're a first time creator and nobody, I, I mean, I, I'm lucky in that I've done cool things like speak at the United Nations and you know, travel around the world talking about social media, but in the comics world, nobody knows who I am. So I wanted to make sure as I started to enter it that I was doing it right and proper. And so I, did, I was releasing it on the site for about a year or two before finally we said, okay, let's put it out on Comixology, and if it sells uh, X amount, then we'll, you know, we'll put it out in print, and then I'll start going to the comic conventions. And eventually you did it such that you are putting out a full book at a time, starting with issue four, I believe. How far have you actually written and had the art complete for the book? Uh, so issue one through four is done but what we did was i scrapped most so again from the testing process you get to learn what works and what doesn't so i threw out almost the entire first issue based on reader feedback for vengeance nevada so the issue that's actually out on comiXology which the entire world now knows is issue one for me is actually issue two we changed a couple of things just to reflect that i think there's certain expectations that come with Kristen jacobs and her story arc the original issue one we found started in too dark of a place for most readers to, to enter that world. So we threw it out and uh, we said, okay, issue two is now issue one. So I have issues one, two, and three finished. And Peter and I, if we're not going to, uh, right now I'm, I'm working on a book proposal that just went out to a bunch of agents. And uh, if Peter and I are not working on that graphic novel, then we'll continue on putting out more issues until we reach the end, which should be about issue 20, 21. Please tell me about your artist, Peter Zaplarski. We met in an interesting way. Uh, <laughs> There's uh, one of the things that you'll you'll see if you read through both of my books is there's, there's no secrets with me. Uh, I give away my cell phone number. You know, I, I text <laughs> I text people all the time. I discourage people from calling only because I've had a few experiences where I couldn't get off the phone with people, and I'm too polite to be like, okay, this conversation needs to stop. So uh, there was more than a few three hour conversations where I was like, all right, nobody call me. You can absolutely text me. And so the reason why I set all that up is I found Peter. 
because uh, he used to illustrate superheroine in peril artwork, uh, which is a genre that I'm a fan of. And so we worked together on a couple of those things. I said, you know, your stuff is really good. I, I feel like there's more we could do together besides you know, posting or doing like inappropriate photos for my own enjoyment. So that's that's how we met was we had this weird encounter in DeviantArt. And I said, we can do, I think you and I could do better. And uh, he agreed. And so for the past three years now, we've been working together on not only Vengeance Nevada, uh, but also the comic Jobbers, which is set in the Vengeance Nevada universe, which is about uh, a group of pro wrestlers and uh, superheroes. And uh, Peter's also working with me on the national story of minor significance, which, which is the graphic novel, which is now being pitched to agents. So uh, he's in Poland. His last name is pronounced Chaparski. Uh, I know people really struggled <laughs> with the pronunciation of his last name. So I had to ask him after a while what the correct pronunciation was. Uh, we've never actually talked. Like, the entire relationship has been through email. Okay. And uh, it, it's been great. Uh, it, I really can't complain. I've been doing the comic thing for years now on the side. And he's the first artist I felt comfortable uh, going ahead and doing a full book with. And the book's in black and white. Uh, Vengeance Nevada, but there's some spot coloring in there, which I find to be a very interesting and effective technique. Do you find people that you get feedback from who read the comic, do they even recall that it's in black and white? I mean, does it eventually just kind of not even occur to them and they're just so used to seeing the spot color that it, they forget that? From the reviews that the book has gotten, so I mean, so far everyone has commented on it being black and white. Uh, and the use of color to draw things to their attention. So I think that's actually one of the things that's made the book stand out. Because if you look at a lot of webcomics, it's going to sound like I'm criticizing them, but it's not meant to. A lot of um, webcomics, they have a certain look to them or a certain style. And after a while, they tend to blend into each other. And so making Vengeance of Auto Black and White was deliberate. Because initially, when I was putting it out on the web, I said, I, I want this to not fall into that trap of it looks like a lot of the web comics that are out there today. And when will the next issue be out? Okay, so this is the million dollar question um, that I've been getting quite a bit. We're shooting for August, the cover is being worked on right now. Uh, again, because the issues are done, but I started them with issue two. Uh, we did make some alterations that we're finishing up now. So tentatively, it'll be out in August. And the book will go quarterly starting in 2019. So there'll be four issues a year. I think that's a schedule Peter and I can stick to. Uh, hopefully, you know, both of us can free up some more time and put it out more regularly. But because it's only 20 or so issues, I didn't want to rush it either. You know, I didn't want to put out something every month and play this game of, all right, well, I'm going to have to blow through the story in order to tell it. I kind of like putting it out there and watching people react to it and, and having there be a little bit of build up between issues and then treating each issue released as, as its own event, as opposed to just saying, hey, uh, here's next month's installment. Now, your other comics, A Story of National Significance, is that going to come out as a complete graphic novel at some point? Yeah, so that's being pitched, right? I just sent off uh, earlier today to an agent to uh, complete a book proposal. So those 20 pages that are up on my site uh, are the preview pages. And so what will happen is right now it's going to a bunch of agents. And if nobody bites, I will probably just put it out myself. Um, I have no problem doing that. One of the things I'm finding with a privacy book is that the privacy book is not in stores the same way social media is bullshit is. And so it's getting a little difficult for people to find it without going to Amazon. And so I said, all right, if I'm going to do a 200-page graphic novel and Peter's going to illustrate 200 pages, uh, we, we would really like if it's in the bookstores first before we go and we do it on the run. And Jobbers 2 is going to eventually come out as its own book? Jobbers is meant to be the backup comic for Vengeance Nevada. Starting with issue 2, issue part 1 of Jobbers will run. Uh, so like I said, I, I've had to reconfigure some of these issues. And so the original issue 3 is over 30 pages. And you can tell it was written in such a way that we were releasing it in segments as opposed to releasing it as one comic. So for that reason, issue 2, when it comes out, is only about 22 pages of Vengeance Nevada followed by eight pages of jobbers. And so I'm kind of using jobbers to make sure that each issue that comes out for your two ninety nine, you're getting 30 pages no matter what. And I want to talk a bit about your other books as well. Now, you mentioned one of them about social media. And without getting into too much, I want people to read it. And I just want to hit on a few highlights just to whet people's appetite. And I'll ask you to talk about each of these topics. Now, 
all marketing is, you say, BS beyond four basic principles. What are those four basic things that people just need to keep in mind? I think I've boiled it down even further. Uh, since, okay. Since the year that, uh, I mean, so the, the thing with social media is bullshit is that it was written in 2011. It was published by St. Martin's in 2012. And uh, it's still pretty accurate and up to date. I mean, there's maybe like 5% of the material that I need to definitely get rid of for the second edition. Uh, but uh, how I basically break it down into is this. If your parents understand and can convey to other people what you do or what you make, then that's marketing. I, and in the book, I originally said it was something that grandma can easily understand and pass on and share with others. But I, I found that you can really boil it down to something even more simple, which is just getting other people to actively pass it on on their own without you poking them with a stick. Okay. has to be easy, easy to open, easy to use, easy to pass along. Easy to understand, yeah. I think, and that's that's where a lot of people mess up. I mean, I have this list of about ten thousand uh, podcasts, and one of the things I'm finding is that many of them have like these crazy descriptions where it's like, you know, hey, we're a movie podcast, but also we talk about Greek culture. Uh, it's so like <laughs> they're, they're like all over the place, and so that's like the number one mistake that everyone makes when it comes to marketing. And so that's why I'm like, can you explain to your mom or dad what you do to the point where they can easily pass it on without you helping them. And if you can do that, then congratulations, uh, you're now in the marketing business. And if you can't, then uh, go, go back to square one. I hope I kept my brand simple enough. I try to make yeah. like one sentence. You know? <laughs> Which is how it should be. It should be dead simple. I mean, so I, the pitch for Vengeance Nevada, when we first put it together was, can you make Ghost Rider interesting? And then we boiled that down even further to funny Ghost Rider. And that was the entire, you know, I kept that on an index card on my wall for like two years. It's just a funny ghostwriter. Uh, and that's how I was able to explain the comic while I was putting it together. So uh, a lot of people really struggle with that. And I think that that's key is just being able to convey what you do in a funny and simple way. Something else in your book, too, that I've discussed with a friend of mine is that people who use social media to promote their product, their service, only about 1% of the people out there in social media actually interact. You know, the rest right. are kind of the fringe on either end, making a lot of noise. But as far as people engaging with you, which to me is the most important part, because I want to get the feedback. How are things going? What do you like? What don't you like? What do you want to hear? What don't you want to hear? And getting that little bit of feedback is what's most important in making what I do and what you do better. That to me is the beauty of social media. That's what it should be used for. But people don't realize, you know, you can have... 500, 5,000 followers. And as you mentioned in your book, and that was happens to me too, I didn't earn them. <laughs> I don't know who they are. <laughs> they just popped up all of a sudden. <laughs> and how many of them are real? Right, right? exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, so for people that that haven't followed me on Twitter at BJ Mendelssohn, I have about 700,000 uh, Twitter followers, about 83% of them are real. Uh, and I know confidently it's 83% because I've had like six different companies test it for me. Because uh, especially after the whole <laughs> Trump-Russia thing, I was like, all right, I really need to be sure that, that these people are real. Uh, but yeah, it's important to understand that only 1% uh, on any platform do the majority of the commenting. So it's good to get that feedback, but you also don't want to get lost in it. I think that that's something that happens a lot. Uh, there's a lot of comics creators who have gotten upset and deleted their Twitter accounts. Uh, or they've let well, like the comic skate, I don't know if you saw that whole thing. Basically, they were harassing people for being too liberal, essentially. Uh, and a lot of comics creators were like, I'm not going to go on Twitter anymore because this is this is what it is. And I, I think it's important to always get feedback, right? Like get, going back to that minimum viable product thing, you can't improve your product unless you're getting feedback. But it's also important to understand where that feedback is coming from and who is giving it to you and to explore other sources. So Kristen Jacobs is Native American. I am not Native American. So uh, it, you know, it's important that uh, the actual Kristen, who I am friendly with, uh, who's Mohawk, was a source of inspiration for the character and some of my other friends who gave me their feedback on the character and how she interacts with her father, who we see in the second issue, and her relationship with the tribe and the language. And, and so... I try to get feedback from as many places as I, as I can beyond the social platforms. And I think as long as you do that, you're okay. But if you do what a lot of brands do where, oh, my God, people are pissed at uh, show X or people are pissed at this celebrity, 
we're going to pull our funding and relationship from them because people are mad on social media. I, I think that's where a lot of trouble starts. Now, that's an older book of yours. Good read. Very good read. The other one that came out more recently, End of Privacy, that one, you also have a companion podcast that's narrated talking about various chapters, the content within the book. Tell me a bit about that book and why you decided now was the time to write it. The first thing about the audiobook is that the podcast is the actual audiobook. What I decided to do was give it away for free, but with commercials. So the trade-off being if you want the privacy and how we get it back for free, you can. You can get it as a podcast, but if you like the book or want to support me, you can buy it on Audible for, I think it's like 11 bucks. So uh, the podcast is the actual audio from the book. I think that I got into that book because there was a lot left unsaid from social media's bullshit. There was a lot of things that I didn't know until after social media's bullshit came out. And I really started to get into the weeds, working with engineers and, and understanding uh, some of the tactics that internet companies use to grow. I mean, going back to 1994, pretty much every major internet company has done something kind of scammy in one way, shape or form. Uh, in order for them to reach these multi-billion dollar valuations and that, you know, it's up to and including scraping your email and and spamming people or uploading your contacts and spamming those contacts or creeping on you and buying data profiles and finding different ways to target you. That section, along with uh, this other section on the media, had got cut from social media's bullshit. And I knew that I wanted to go back to it. And it was just fortuitous that this guy over in the United Kingdom came to me and said, uh, would you like to write a book about privacy? And I said, okay, sure. So I, I tend to fall ass backwards into things. Like that's the story of my life. Uh, <laughs> and, this, and the story of my career, I'm a little bit like uh, like Kramer or George Costanza to that point. So uh, it just so happened that this guy came to me and said, I will, I will pay you a small amount of money to write about privacy. And I said, oh, well, I just so happened to have the stuff that was cut out from social media is bullshit that we can expand. And so that's how the privacy book came about. And obviously, you know, with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica and all everything that's going on right now overseas with GDPR, I, again, I fell ass backwards into very, very good timing for the book to come out. I'll tell you, I didn't realize that the podcast was actually the actual chapter because it was very good. There's a lot there. And I did not know that the whole privacy issue started. We all lost it back starting as far back as World War One, So I thought that was very yeah. eye-opening, yeah. You know what? So the funny thing is that I've been starting my presentations pointing out that you could even go back earlier to Abraham Lincoln and the War Department uh, sitting in and listening to messages over the telegraph and then rounding up people that were disruptive to their drafting of Union soldiers. And so throughout American history, we've had these these different instances where we've spied on people and taken action for one reason or another. Uh, it wasn't really until World War One where the technology came into the forefront and we were like, oh, <laughs> now we don't need to rely on these stupid telegraphs. We can just have all the data come to us and uh, and go through it. So, uh, yeah, it's something that's been going on forever. And this is something that's controversial in the privacy community. Because um, if you look at most privacy advocates, a lot of them have strong opinions about the government. <laughs> and I'm sort of the opposite where I'm kind of like, you know, I'm not saying it's right, but it also doesn't matter because they've been doing this long since I was born and they'll be doing it long after I'm gone. And so I'm more concerned about what these for-profit companies are doing with my privacy than I am uh, with the government. But yeah, it's been going on forever. Well, we're going to transition now to our fun questions. But before we do, one of your favorite comedians, George Carlin, why is he your favorite? What does he mean to you as a comedian? So for me growing up, how do I describe? So I love my family and I should say that before I say <laughs> anything <laughs> else. But um, I, you know, my dad was an assistant principal in the Bronx and he worked all the time. So I really, you know, there's six kids that he had to take care of. So he was constantly uh, working to, to help get us through. And uh, my mom was always physically around, but not mentally available uh, for one reason or another. So George Carlin, for me, was like this uncle. Here was this normal functioning adult. And I had, you know, I have two mentally disabled brothers and um, I did not grow up in a functional household. And so when I saw him, I was like, well, he's got his shit together. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's on stage. He's making people laugh. He's doing interesting, funny things. And I want to do that. I would like to go on stage and, and make people laugh. And so I, you know, I read all his books. I, I have every book that's ever been written about him. I have all of his HBO specials. To me, he he was like the adult presence in the home. 
Uh, and I know, like, if anyone hears a Jew fan and George Carlin, you know that that might sound kind of odd. But I, for me, he was like a role model. And so a lot of the way that I write, a lot of the way that I speak, it's all through growing up with Carlin. What routine of his was your favorite? Modern Man is up there. Uh, I know that that's a lot of like recent people's favorite. Uh, a Place for My Stuff, which is something that, you know, I actively used in uh, the End of Privacy book. I really like baseball and football, though. I think that that's my favorite. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's funny to me. It's funny on a number of levels because I'm a big baseball fan. He was a big baseball fan. I think today he would not be a fan of the NFL. as all the stuff going on with how greedy and you know having taxpayers pay for billionaire stadiums and things like that i just don't think that he would like it but it's a very pro football <laughs> die drive that, that he goes on and i just i just love the language of it because as much as i love baseball when you listen to him do that you realize how ridiculous it is like you realize that you pin a good part of your calendar year on a child's game uh being played by multi <laughs> multi-millionaire adults and, and it's ridiculous because they don't want to come out and play when it's raining. And so that, that to me is his favorite. Is my favorite. Yeah, he, he was one of the greats for sure because he just had a way of breaking things down and making them seem so ridiculous. Things we see every day in our life, things we do every day in our life and kind of like a modern day philosopher. And he just had that sense of humor that really helps you kind of get through life to take some of those absurd things and just make fun of them and make fun of ourselves too. Yeah, I think that's important. My whole mission is very simple. It's to educate and inform, and preferably you're laughing while that happens. Uh, if I can make people laugh around the planet, which so far I've done successfully, I'd, I'd like to say, uh, I'm good. <laughs> I've done what I've set out to do in life. Like, so, yeah, I, just having that influence in my life was really big, and, and watching him, uh, to have people forget their troubles, even if it was only for an hour on HBO every two years, was something wonderful. And uh, to get to some of the fun questions, let's start with rest and relaxation. What do you like to do for rest and relaxation? So I don't really rest or relax, which is a problem. And the, the reason why is I, I almost died a few years back and my health is probably not the best to the point where you know I, I have it under control i manage it i'm fine i don't want anyone to text me and be like are you okay uh i'm okay <laughs> you know but it's not to the point where i should feel very secure about the future and so because of that i am always working i'm always you know today i put out that thing for the graphic novel and then i wrote to a bunch of podcasts about doing interviews on there and i was thinking to myself i should probably be writing a fiction book so i have something else to put out while all these other things just stayed. So I really don't relax because I'm constantly being driven by by that inner voice. It's like, hey, you almost died when you were 30. Maybe you should pick up the pace and, and do as much as you, as you can. I look at it like, okay, I only have so much time left. Yeah, I got plenty of time. I said, no, I don't know that. I want to get right. as much done as I possibly can. We all take it for granted, right? I mean, we think we'll live forever, but uh, I, I think I was a little lucky to have that experience a bit earlier than a lot of people do, and that that's what drives me. Now, thinking back to a birthday... One that stands out in your memory. Why would you pick that one? Was there a gift or a person that was there? Or was it at a certain place? What birthday stands out in your memory? My 30th, because I was in Wales. I was in the middle of <laughs> I was in the middle of this rain-soaked field, which I guess is every day in Wales, but <laughs> we're gonna go with describing it as a rain-soaked field. And I was there for a conference called the Do Lectures, and they invited me to talk about social media as bullshit. And I didn't know they were going to do this, but when we went into the dining area, after everyone had eaten, they came out with this cake, and they started singing Happy Birthday. I'm like, oh, that's really nice. They're celebrating someone's birthday that's here. And I didn't realize it was for me <laughs> until they got to me, and then I was trying that. I was trying my best not to tear up, because to me, that was a big birthday for a lot of reasons. It was, it was the first birthday after I had gotten divorced. Uh, it was the first birthday after social media's bullshit had came out that I was traveling. It was sort of the first birthday of my my life post living in upstate New York for the past six or eight years. And to me, it was kind of like, you're going to be OK. You're going to be fine. The, the plot twist is that I then got sick uh, and then had massive surgery three months later for my heart. So <laughs> it's a good birthday. And, it, you know, I, I will always remember having my 30th birthday celebrated in Wales. But at the same time, I, I also remember being on stage with like 101 degree fever. Go, and yo, I nailed it. I did my presentation, everyone laughed. 
But then I went back and I passed out for like a day. Like I was just out of commission uh, and then got really sick after. So it was a big, it was a big birthday is what I'm saying. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, thinking back to your room growing up, what was on the wall, what posters or what pictures and what kind of music you had on your turntable or your, your Walkman or your iPod? Yeah. So I was a Walkman kid. Uh, I was cassettes. There were so many cassettes all over the house that you could easily trip and fall to your death. (laughs) <laughs> with, with them uh, and most of it was like bad 80s heavy metal because that's when my older sibling you know i have three older siblings and so uh even though i'm not generation x i was born the first year that they count the millennials even though i don't quite identify with the entire age group uh i am very influenced by gen x so you know i have nirvana and pearl jam and iron maiden and, and metallica and bands like that it was definitely the soundtrack growing up uh the more metallica the better I could not get enough of them. And all over the world, it was probably New York Met stuff, definitely New York Met stuff and um, comic book posters. So my first comic book crossover event, coincidentally, was the Infinity Gauntlet. And so it's really surreal seeing it now as this blockbuster movie that everyone on the planet's going to go watch at the end of the month. But that was my first. And so I had that huge issue one uh, George Perez cover with Thanos and the Infinity Gauntlet and with big symbol saying, uh, the end begins here. And there was a lot of that on my walls. Think of all the books that you have. Hypothetically, if you were stuck on a deserted island, what is the one book that you would want to have with you? Oh, wow. Uh, I owe, So I own a disgusting amount of books <laughs> uh, to the point where I have books scattered all throughout like New York State at this point that people are either holding out from me or I just ran out of space. It would probably be a book on Abraham Lincoln. I, most likely... Uh, Man, that's tough. It would probably be a team of rivals because that's a huge book. It always takes me a while to read through it. I read through it every couple of years. But anything with Lincoln, I, I think, is what I would have with me because I, I just find his story to be inspirational. I, I have at least 15 books on the guy, and I never get sick of them. So it would probably be Team of Rivals by Doris Kieran's Goodwin. She's an amazing historian. I love her work. I, I think anything by her, I would also have on that desert island if I could. Excellent. Very good. Now, you're a very successful guy, and a toy company says, BJ, we're going to make an action figure of you. What would you want to be your accessory? So in an upcoming issue of Vengeance Nevada, there is a flashback scene to a Hollywood movie set, and I needed something going on behind Kristen to sort of break up the tension. So I'm actually in line behind her, and I'm wearing this sock puppet, and... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm screaming at the caterer because he didn't properly take the carrots and size them from smallest to largest. And so I'm just yelling at him saying, this is anarchy. You cannot do this. It's unacceptable. And I'm doing it with the sock puppet. So that would be the toy. It would be me with, with the angry sock puppet and a plate of carrots sized from smallest to largest. <laughs> I have never had that answer before, and I probably never will again. <laughs> BJ, what is your beverage of choice when you're resting and relaxing? It's water. Uh, I've had to, so again, because my health is not, my health is not the best. And so for that reason, I'm on a very specific diet. So it's always water. I I do sneak coffee, even though I'm not supposed to have it. Uh, But I know it's a boring answer, but it's always going to be water, preferably from the tap, uh, because that's the only thing I could really or should be drinking. And we should all drink more, including me. I don't, and I should. (laughs) I am right now. Final question. Out of all the interviews that you've done, what question have you never been asked that you want to be asked? Something people don't know about you, but you wish they did. What's the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to you? I don't get that a lot. And I feel like I have so many different funny answers for it. And I always cycle through my head, like, which answer could I use today? And so that would definitely be the question. And the answer would be, uh, in the fourth grade, my brother and I had the bright idea of participating in a talent show where we lip synced to We Built This City. <laughs> and because we were poor, we didn't have money for props or anything. So it was just us miming using different instruments. And I didn't think it was possible for children to be booed off of the stage. But uh, <laughs> you will believe that children can be booed off the stage and that was that was definitely one of those instances. So, yeah, I've, I've never been asked that question. I've always been wanted to ask, though. That's great. So how can people reach you if they want to give feedback, ask questions? 
So I encourage people to text me. Uh, please don't call for the reasons I mentioned in the interview. I mean, you can, and you can leave a voicemail, and maybe I'll call you back. But I, I try to steer people towards text. And so my phone number, this is my actual number, is 646-331-8341. And if people text me the word sheetrock, which is spelled exactly as it sounds, I will send them a free PDF copy of Social Media is Bullshit. So that that's the best way to reach me. Uh, email also works, bjbjmendelson.com. I have social media profiles uh, only because you need them for SEO purposes, for you know the marketers among you. you know, Google likes to tell you that the social media stuff holds no weight, but I've found time and time again working with different clients that it's important to have those social profiles even if you don't use them and have them linking to your central sites. So I, you know, I do have Twitter. That's the thing I'm most active on with at BJ Mendelssohn. But I, you know, if you follow me on the other stuff, it's going to be a waste of your time because I, I don't actively use them. Folks, there's an easy way to get a copy of social media. See how I'm editing myself? <laughs> <laughs> I just say social media. Uh, but it's great. And please, it's entertaining. It's informative. You owe it to yourself. You think you know everything about it? You don't. BJ Mendelssohn, thank you so much for being on Creator Talks this week. Thanks for having me. I had a blast. Coming up later this week, I have an interview with two creators, both working on the original graphic novel being published through Image Comics, Crossroad Blues. Ace Adkins, the writer, who worked as both a journalist and is also a New York Times bestselling author, and also the author of Robert B. Parker's Spencer novels. I will also be joined by the artist on the book Crossroad Blues, Marco Finnegan. Please join us. Thank you for joining me for Creator Talks this week. The show is available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, and also on Amazon Echo and Dot devices. Just say, Alexa, play podcast Creator Talks to hear the latest episode. In addition, you can listen to the show and follow it through Podbean. Your feedback is greatly appreciated, so please rate and review on iTunes if you like the show or an episode that you heard. Your ratings and reviews go a long way to helping the show, and I can't thank you enough for taking a bit of time to do that. For your convenience, in the show notes of each podcast, I have a link to my iTunes page where you can rate and review the show and see the entire list of shows available. If you haven't heard them all, take a look through. There are living legends and up-and-coming comic creators. Tell family and friends who like comics and comic book creators about the show. And to subscribe, the content is free. Just as valued are your comments and feedback. You can reach me through Facebook and Twitter at Creator Talks Pod. That's at Creator Talks Pod. You can also reach out to me by email. You can find that at my website, creatortalks.com. At the website, you will also find blog posts, reviews of books that I have read that you might want to read too, my catalog of podcasts, and videos and other written articles on the website creatortalks.com. A hearty thank you to all my guests. It is an honor and a privilege for you to make time to be on the show and talk to me about your work. It is your knowledge and insight into the creative process that makes the show so unique. My thanks also goes out to my family who makes this show possible, especially my executive co-producer, Mrs. Calloway. I'll be back each and every Thursday with a new interview. For Creator Talks, I'm your host, Christopher Calloway. Until next time. <laughs>